Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And um, I am talking about uh, Talbot's Tower and the story of Talbot's Tower and the major conservation work that was carried out over a number of years. Um, as you all know, um, Kilkenny is a medieval city and was one of the most important uh, walled towns in Ireland during the medieval period. Um, it was the largest walled town in Ireland and I discovered this morning it's the same size as Chester because its, uh, it's enclosing walls were two miles in length. Um, along the length of the walls were a number of gatehouses and towers. There were nine gatehouses, or seven gatehouses and nine towers. Talbot's Tower was located in the southwest corner and um, so it is the most intact of the um, city's medieval defences. So um, its overall significance, the fact that it's a corner site is very significant because it gives a key understanding of the city walls. It's also the um, only complete surviving uh, defensive tower as part of the walls. Um, architecturally, it's quite a sophisticated building um, in terms of its geometry and its stonework. Um, it has a, quite a very interesting internal dome that has its existing uh, wicker centering, which is very rare in Ireland. And um, it also reflects kind of 800 years of building and, uh, and change. Um, this is a photograph of the building back in 2005, before any of the works began. And just two sort of important aspects of the um, project were the fact that it was research-led and very much a team effort. Um, there was major archaeological research was undertaken. Um, it started with the um, Kilkenny um, Town Walls Conservation Plan, and then it followed through with um, further uh, research and um, archaeological excavations um, and that really led to the understanding of the site and also um, it uh, informed the decision making in future works in terms of re repair and rebuilding. As I said it was very much a team effort, there was a Kilkenny Borough Council as it was then with, this, um, with the Wall Steering Committee and um, the Heritage Council, the Irish Wall Towns Network um, the archaeologists and the design team, and then later the contractors uh, who were employed to work on the project. Um, it is a protected structure and it's also protected under the National Monuments Act, so all work was under ministerial consent and also a Part A planning application was made for the works back in 2008. This is a view of the tower, the roof of the tower, before uh, works began. The building as it stands today is um, it's a circular turret. It's about 9.7 metres high and about 5.6 metres in diameter internally. It has a domed roof um, which has a flagstone finish on it behind a parapet. The parapet has a number of drainage chutes around its perimeter. Internally it has this lovely wicker dome and it also has three uh, windows which are represented as arrow loops externally. And these windows are raised from ground level and they incorporate seating and some cut stone to the interior. Uh, this is a further image of the building before works began. And um, this is looking from inside where the model school um, is located. <coughs> You can see the east curtain wall, which once extended as far as the castle on the left-hand side, and the north curtain wall, which would have extended as far as the River Brega um, originally, and the staircase wall before, again, before works began. So in terms of the timeline, um, I suppose what is so interesting about Talbot's Tower, um, when you look at it, Initially, um, it's hard to know what it is besides its circular tower, but in fact, it incorporates at least four phases of construction. The first phase, um, the circular tower, was constructed in circa 1250. Um, that was an open-backed turret, and it had a timber roof on it. 
Now that would have replaced an earlier timber structure that was built probably around 1200. So um, by late medieval period, the tower was heightened to its current height. And when it was heightened, the dome was created and the, the paving placed on the top of that. Um, the intramural staircase was extended up to the, to to the domed roof. Um, and any other changes to that? No, I think that was about it. Then um, during the Georgian period, um, the windows were widened. So two of the windows were widened and sash windows were inserted into it. And the put logs um, were filled in. Um, also, the crenellations were changed at the top to sort of uh, appear like um, a folly in a back garden. Um, and then, I suppose around that time as well, the town ditch was, was filled in and some of the, um, some of the walls were uh, lost at that stage. Um, then, by the early Victorian times, so the beginning of the 19th century when Ormond Road was built, much of the wall on the eastern side was uh, demolished at that stage. Um, the biggest change was the mid-19th century when the model school was built. The ground level was uh, lowered and also the, um, a garden was created on the roof of the tower. Before the uh, mound was created, a lot of the stones had been robbed out. So um, earth was, uh, was placed up there and this garden was created and there were um, uh, strawberries and flowers and other things growing up there. Um, other works that happened were the windows that were inserted um, in the previous uh, hundred years were taken out again and they were just blocked up. Um, then onto the modern um, era, really, um, very little happened besides a doorway being created uh, to connect the school back over to the um, the other part of the site. And in doing so, they cut through the rampart and created a kind of concrete wall either side. And then most dramatically, in 1989, the outer wall collapsed and with it much of the staircase. So that left the inner wall sort of uh, intact, but in a perilous condition. But I think there was a commitment made at that stage that the wall uh, would be rebuilt and the stone, the stone staircase would be um, reinserted. And um, that's just some um, maps illustrating the, the changes over the years. You can see from the Dan survey that the walls were still very much intact 400 years after they were first created. And um, in the 18th century, they were still around Talbot's Tower, they were still very much intact but all the changes then happened subsequent to that. So um, a background to the works. Um, certainly the, uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of talk about the, um, the importance of archeology span and the, um, the, the interpretation of the site. And certainly as architects, um, our knowledge is more post 1700 than pre 1700. And we had two very um, important archaeological teams on the site um, before and during the works. So we had <coughs> Kilkenny um, archaeology under um, Colin O'Driscoll doing much of the excavation works. And we had Ben Murta doing uh, the uh, above ground works and building survey works. And again, he's created some uh, lovely drawings, as we've seen in the previous presentations as well. Um, other members of the design team included the engineer who was Ivor McElveen. Um, the works were phased over about five years and as it's all public money, each phase was tendered on e-tenders. So we ended up having four different contractors on the site. Um, now luckily they were you know, all really good contractors, but I suppose in an ideal world you'd want maybe the one contractor uh, for just a bit of continuity. So again, here are some of the archaeological drawings. So these were all stone accurate, hand drawn by Ben Murta. And uh, again, we used these drawings. We inserted them into AutoCAD and used them as our condition survey drawings. Um, equally, um, Colleen O'Driscoll produced some very fine drawings of his excavations. They were all on 
AutoCAD and color coded, but I don't actually have any of those on file, so I can't sort of show them. Um, these drawings here show the two sides of the walls. So on the right hand side, we have the existing wall that, uh, that did not collapse. That's the inner face of it. And this was all recorded before it was taken down. And then on the left hand side, you can see the, um, the inner part of that wall, which was really rubble. And that's where the staircase was located. These are example of our drawings where we've taken Ben's drawings, brought them into AutoCAD and marked them up as our condition survey. And then they formed um, the, most of the content of our working drawings that were sent to the contractors. Uh, two interesting sketches which, which also helped to inform our research. One of them was a late 18th century um, engraving by Gross. Um, which shows the town wall on the east before it was refaced. And obviously you can see the staircase and, and the, um, the slope of the staircase uh, going up to the roof. And then the sketch here by James Graves, which is mid 19th century, and it's just before the model school was built. Then in 2007, the first uh, bit of work was to properly record this section of wall before it was taken down. Um, Margaret Gowan and company um, were commissioned to carry out some rectified photographs um, and number the walls before the deconstruction and these are some of the photographs taken by the company. Um, we have some other photographs here just showing you the work in progress. On the left hand side we're just looking down at the wall there and you can see that um, this is before any excavation work has been done to the ditch, was on, which is on the outer side of the site. Uh, in the middle there, you can see the numbering system for the wall that was deconstructed. Um, I think mainly the larger stones were numbered as distinct from the rubble. And then on the right-hand side there, you can see the inner face, which um, is where the, the staircase was located. So, as I mentioned, these works were phased over a number of years. Um, the first phase of work, of building work, the excavation was ongoing, and the excavation included the town ditch and the roof of the uh, building and um, also one or two other areas of the rampart. So, um, in terms of the architectural work and um, the first focus was really on repair and repointing of the tower itself and also repair the parapet to stop all the water ingress into the building and to try and protect the dome. So when the building was extended in the um, in the sort of uh, 1500s the you can see from the diagram there on the right hand side that the crenellations and the arrow loops were sort of built over with later masonry. But we tried to sort of um, show that when we were repointing the works. Now, one idea was to actually slightly change the color of the um, mortar so that maybe you could read the changes better when you looked at the building. Now, I think that wasn't as successful as we thought it would be. But we also kind of opened up the arrow loops somewhat so that they would be more easily read. And if you can see it from the photograph, um, from this photograph here, where we took out some of the stones that were infilled there just so that that was um, more readable. You can also see we replaced some of the missing stones up at the parapet and we repaired those chutes. This is an example of the windows that were opened up and then infilled. You can see on the left hand side, this is where um, a window would have been installed in the 18th century and then in the 19th century it was um, infilled with brickwork. So as part of this works, we reopened all three windows because all had been blocked up and replaced the missing stone there with a uh, new Kilkenny limestone. You can also see some of the um, put log holes. Internally, again, we've got uh, Ben's drawing and survey drawing of the windows. So each of the windows was opened up. We put a simple stainless steel frame with some mesh just to prevent any uh, birds getting back into the building. And then the window 
uh, embrasures were rebuilt where there was missing stone. So there was some um, well-executed dressed stone that was carried out by Talis and Company. And we reinserted the raised area of the windows. Because these windows were raised up from ground level, most of that had been missing, but we rebuilt that up and we uh, reincorporated the seating either side of the window, the, all under the um, research from um, the archaeologists on this. The next element of the work was the roof. So although the fact that there was a garden on the roof was quite an interesting um, area, we kind of felt that, that that had to be taken off because it was causing damage internally. Five minutes, okay. Um, so we knew from previous excavations that there were flagstones under the, under the roof. So um, anyway, the, all of that earth was removed. There was about 30 tons of earth up there. So that was all removed. And the, um, that's just a sequence of some of the work. About 30% of the flagstones remained, but we also had scars from where the rest of the flagstones were. So we were able to recreate the roof. Um, we sourced a similar flagstone. We have a geologist as part of our team, and she sourced um, a flagstone that would match the original stone, which we found in Killinall um, Quarry nearby. And the, um, and the roof was then uh, repaired. So we, we actually put a damp room membrane under the flagstones to prevent water getting back into the dome beneath and cleared all the chutes around the perimeter. So that is, these are just a few photographs of the, um, of the roof and the stainless steel handrail we inserted because this is now an accessible roof. I suppose the biggest element of the, of the work was really the rebuilding of the two walls and the staircase. So I'm just going to go very quickly through these. You can see the numbered stones there that were taken down, that were stored on site over the years, and um, the works on site here. The, the contractor built um, a fully enclosed scaffold to protect the works and to enable him to work throughout the, um, the period. Again, due to uh, time constraints with grants, this work had to be done in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, also there, there's a photograph of the corbel stones that were taken out and they were reinserted. They would have supported an inner wall walk at one stage. And here's some images of the wall, almost, uh, or the staircase, which is almost finished and then in its finished state. We had about four or five um, steps that were still on site. The rest of them had been lost, but we had the scars on the inner walls, so we were able to exactly locate where the staircase was originally, the size of the steps, etc., and then they were all recreated to match. And then you've got the completed wall with the numbered stones, as you can see, still um, still marked. Um, that that was the major bit of work. The other the other elements to finish off the site was the ditch, um, and the outer face. Now, as I mentioned, the outer wall had collapsed in 1989, so we had no sort of survey, we had no accurate information on that. But when um, the archaeologist excavated the ditch, um, there were traces of the stonework there, so they kind of used that in rebuilding the outer face and the batter. Um, we originally said that we would kind of use a shelter coat on that face because uh, we didn't have accurate survey. But in fact, the contractor did such a good job of rebuilding it that, uh, you know, there was a decision that it should be just left and, um, and exposed and would probably give a better understanding of the site. Then in addition, that, that's the outer wall complete. <coughs> then there were other, other works to the, to the North Curtain Wall, which I'll just skip through there, but they were sort of supported and rebuilt, and the stone arch that was created in 1974 was rebuilt. Um, that's an example of a cobbled path that was uncovered during the excavations, and we just left it as it was. Um, that's the doorway that was um, completed, and you can see the wall walk above the doorway. 
there's also a scar there just to the left of the doorway and that actually represents the original line of the town wall running east. That wall was refaced in the 19th century and um, uh, so it was narrowed when it was refaced but we put a shelter coat there just so that um, there is a reference there to the original size of the wall. So I think finally um, it was an ambition of Kilkenny County Council and the Heritage Council to recreate a pocket park in the city to help to represent the um, importance of Talbot Tower and to interpret it archaeologically and also to create a bit of green space in, in the town. This surface had been um, resurfaced in concrete back in the 1970s and you can see remnants of the stone that um, belonging to the site. So as part of our part eight application, um, we designed a park. You can see there's a little element of the park on the, other, on the inner face, but most of it is on the outer side of the, of the tower. And this is the completed park that was finished by K uh, Kilkenny County Council just a couple of years ago. It's um, fully accessible and um, it just opens up the whole tower and the understanding of it. Um, these are just a few more images of it and a view from the top of the, of the roof as well. Um, there are interpretation panels all around just to explain the whole history of the, um, of the site and the tower. And a very interesting um, kind of use of the building. It was used as part of the Kilkenny Arts Festival this year, which I think is just fantastic. So um, Liam Byrne, who is a viola de gamba player, performed to individuals during the, the festival. So each person came in, had a chat with Liam, and he played a piece of Baroque music um, for five minutes. And... Um, Again, it was used this morning uh, for a poetry reading, so I hope that uh, it gets used for uh, other such events. Um, anyway, I think that just to conclude that um, the Vision and Drive of Kilkenny County Council and the Heritage Council and the Irish World Towns Network uh, was really great because it needs vision and drive for something like this to happen. The approach was very much research and evidence-based and uh, it was a huge effort uh, by all members of the team. So that's it. Thank you.